And let's take our copy of the Word of God and turn to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. We continue on through our study through the seven messages to the seven churches. We are on Thyatira, which is verse number 18. Follow along as I read chapter 2, verse 18. The angel of the church in Thyatira writes, These things says the Son of God who has the eyes like the flame of fire, his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because... You allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat the things sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality. She did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give each one of you according to your works. Now to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He will rule them with the rod of iron. They shall be dashed into pieces like a potter's vessel, as I've also received from my father, and I give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. In 96 AD, the apostle John The last surviving disciple of Jesus Christ is old and he's living in a penal colony. All the other disciples are dead. The church has been severely persecuted. Jesus said, I'll come again. Everyone's wondering, where is he? What's going on? And then Jesus shows up and gives John the big reveal. The book of Revelation, the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. He tells John in Revelation chapter 1, verse 19, write the things which you have seen, chapter 1, the things which are, chapters 2 through 4, and through 3, and the things which shall take place here after, chapters 4 through 22. The things which are, are chapters 2 and 3, they're the seven messages Jesus has for the seven churches found in Asia Minor, We have a slide of those, seven churches. This is an interesting uh, slide because it's showing you the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, Patmos in the middle of the water, that's where John was in exile. And then going up and around, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, we've done those three churches. Thyatira today, Sardis, Ephesus, and Laodicea are the last of the seven churches. So he has these messages in these seven churches. These churches are found in seven cities. And they have specific issues that Jesus speaks to. However, the messages to the seven churches are not just for those seven churches. They are for whoever has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Meaning it's for everyone. And to the seven churches, Jesus says seven different times, starting with verse number seven, he who overcomes, I will give. And then verse number 11, he who overcomes. And verse number 17, he who overcomes. And verse 26, he who overcomes, et cetera, et cetera. He who overcomes. These are the universal messages, the promises given to the one who overcomes. He will be rewarded in some way. John is big on the theme of overcoming, incidentally. Five times in John's epistle, 1 John chapter, uh, 1 John He speaks of overcoming. In chapter 5, we have this passage. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves the child born of Him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and we follow His commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments 
and his commandments are not burdensome. Whoever has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, our, our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world, but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? So it's very simple. Believe in Jesus. Love the children of God. Follow his commandments. If you do this, you will be Nike. That's the Greek word for victorious, for overcomer. You were wearing Nikes today. You didn't realize you had Greek, you had Greek overcoming going on. You are part of my sermon. There you go. Thank you for being an illustration. You overcome. And the one who gets that gets the seven promises, which pertain to, over and over again, eternal life, rewards in heaven. However, loving and obeying is easier said than done. As we see from the messages to the seven churches, only two of the seven have nothing to repent of. The other five do. The rest have been disobedient in some manner. Ephesus had to repent of, remember this one, right? Losing their first love. Pergamus had to repent of abiding false doctrine to persist in the church. Thyatira is, has to repent of actually practicing sexual immorality and idolatry. And then we're going to see Sardis. They basically just don't believe anymore. And then Laodicea, they're incredibly apathetic. But today we're on Thyatira of the seven. Jesus puts the most emphasis on the works of Thyatira. Did you catch that theme? Verse number 19. He said, I know your works. And then he lists what they are. And then in verse number 23, he says, unless they repent of their deeds, and he talks about knowing the works, I judge each one, uh, verse 23 at the end, according to their works. And verse 26, he who overcomes keeps my works. So this message really stresses the works of the individual. I wonder why. Well, maybe it has something to do with the fact that Thyatira is a blue-collar town. It's a working town. Other cities that we've looked at were capital cities, centers of worship with big temples. That's not Thyatira. It's a smaller town. It has no fortifications. So that's, it was easily conquered and destroyed and tore down, down different times as invading armies came through. Uh, it's, it's more of a place to drive through on your way to a more important, more impressive city. So why is anybody living there? Well, it's kind of like an industrial park, right? Great place to set up a business. And the first thing we hear, the first mention of Thyatira is Acts 16, where it we meet Lydia. Lydia's hometown is Thyatira, and Lydia is a seller of purple. And that's important when we learn about Thyatira and what their industry is. But apparently she had moved to Philippi and she was trading purple linens in that city. She was a worshiper of God. And uh, what, what was going on in Acts is that her and some other women were down by the river in Philippi worshiping God. And then Paul meets them and uh, they tell them about Jesus. They tell them about, you know, Jesus coming and rising from the dead and being the Messiah. Of course, they hadn't heard that before. So she hears the gospel and her, uh, she gets baptized and the rest of her household gets baptized. And after Lydia's conversion and baptism, she then insists that Paul and Silas, that they come over and stay at her house. And she becomes a big supporter. And she is the beginning of the church of Philippi. That's cool. She's the biggest supporter and the first convert in the church of Philippi. And then I thought, well, maybe she was instrumental in seeing the church planted in Thyatira because of her business dealings and she has family in that town. Maybe she influenced people and families in her hometown to trust in Jesus as well. For all of us in the workplace, there's always the potential opportunity to share the gospel. We know several fellas here who have started Bible studies at work. And if you want to find out how to do that, talk to John Harris, talk to John Murdoch. These guys have started Bible studies and have been helpful in reaching co-workers with, to Jesus. But we ought to give credit where credit's due for a minute here. Lydia, along with these other God-fearing women, were the founding members of the Church of Philippi. And that is not an abnormality. Women seem to respond to the gospel and commit to following Jesus at a faster rate than men. Could it be that men are more prideful and stubborn? Maybe. 
My dad was a pastor, but my mom came to Jesus first. It was my Aunt Sherry and my grandmother who first took me to church. My mother, who grew up going to church, she thought, well, why am I sending the kids? I should be going with them. So there was mom and Aunt Sherry and my mom, my grandmother, all with us little kids at church, all teaching us about Jesus, but my father was not there. So finally, some men from the church go to the house, and tell him about Jesus, and he decides, oh, I suppose I should come. It just takes men longer. And often, it takes a man to influence a man to get off his butt and show up. So we have to remember that. Old men, old guys, those young fellas, sometimes they just need, they need a little bit of uh, influencing. A little bit of like, what are you doing, kid? You know, smarten up. Take good care of your family. What, what are you doing? And uh, we need those challenges. So guys, you know, keep your head up and look around and encourage those young fellas to do the right thing. But women like Lydia have been vital to the Church of the Living God since its inception, since the first century. When we look at human history and we look at the kingdoms of this world and when it comes to leadership positions, it's very obvious that women are always in the minority. But once we get to the kingdom of heaven and the crowns are being handed out, I think we're going to see a whole lot of women receiving a whole lot of crowns and glory. Little girls like the make-believe Disney princesses. Wait till you get to heaven, girls. You're going to be real princesses as you receive those crowns. And thank God for all the ladies who've done all the work for all these years to earn those crowns. So much of the feeding of the flock began with the faithful ladies who week in and week out, like Linda was up here talking about, in those Sunday school classrooms, in that kids' church, in that Awana, you know, Hannah was talking about her mom's faithfulness and that impacted her life, being raised up in that environment. And that's true of many of us. How many here went to Sunday school growing up as a child? Look, raise it up high. Look at that. Look at all of these people. This is how you started out. This is how you came to know Jesus. And uh, that was big for me. And with regards to the request that we had today in our bulletin, if you go to your QR code, scan that, sign up. Uh, also, you know, that's not just for the ladies. You know, we, we got lots of boys in there and they need, they need a man. To, it takes a man to make a man. And uh, you need to get in there and help out with the heavy lifting. Don't just leave it for the women to do all that work. Because these are the things that Jesus sees and he praises. Verse number 18. I know your works. 19. What are they? Love, service, faith, and patience. And that's what it takes to earn the crowns. Think about it. At the end of days, when you stand before the judgment seat of God, in order to hear God say, well done, good and faithful servants, what do you think you need to have been doing? Fishing? Golfing? Working on the car? Watching a lot of sports? Well done, good and faithful servant. You won fantasy basketball. Or did you need to be doing the good and faithful works? Loving people, serving, faithful, and patient. Hupanemnaoi is the Greek word, means steadfast, to hold fast. And the idea here is not breaking rank. In the midst of the battle, the assault, the steadfast person is the one who won't tail, turn, and run, but they hold their ground, they don't wilt, they don't quit. You know who that guy is who's always showing up? Who's that person? That dependable, going to be there week in and week out. You're thinking of somebody right now, aren't you? That's what you got to be, that kind of person. And we got lots of people like that around here, praise God. We call it our volunteer army. We have such a high percentage of people serving. Often church leadership experts will throw around this statistic. They'll say 20% of the people are doing 80% of the work. Well, that's not true here. We have a much higher percentage. I couldn't give you an accurate number because there's, we have so many volunteers doing so much. I'd forget about somebody. And yet, we need more. We need some steadfast people to step up and volunteer and serve in the classes with the kids. Jesus commends that. Your love, your works. Your love, your service, your faith, and your patience. The church of Thyatira 
like Faith Bible Church, was full of steadfast workers. And that's what Thyatira was all about. They were a industry town. Their main product was wool with and dyeing fabrics, particularly purple dye, which is where Lydia was a, was a, a trader of purple. It came from the Madden roots, the uh, Madden root. That's what it actually looks like right there. There's a picture of it. And uh, they were, it was cherished. This, this dye has been cherished for centuries because its ability to create a wide range of colors from brilliant reds to soft pinks to earthy oranges. Wasn't that descriptive of me? Earthy oranges. The process of dyeing fabrics from madam root involves extracting the dye from the root of the plant and then immersing the fabric in a dye bath, bringing it out, getting it all different colors. So these colorful clothes were big business. A whole textile industry was in Thyatira, but there was also not just clothes, there was leather workers, there was tanners, there was potters, and there were bronze smith. Uh, manufacturing town, lots of workers, and these workers were organized into guilds or Unions, as some of us, we call them nowadays. We've got some union workers in here. Uh, guilds provided benefit for workers. They standardized pay scales, uh, protection uh, from getting abused or unjustly terminated. Uh, being in the guild meant you had job security. It was a place to network and build community. Sons would apprentice with their fathers and learn a trade. So the guild was your family. It was your community. Also, the guilds threw every week Big parties for the guys. Ooh, that's nice, right? Yeah, that was the problem. The guilds had patron gods, and they believed that the gods blessed them. And every week, the guild had a special party to celebrate and sacrifice to the gods. And when the members came to the banquet, they were provided with an all-you-can-eat buffet with an open bar. And the slaves who served in these parties were unclothed, Slave girls. Now, you know me, I love a all-you-can-eat buffet as much as anyone, but this is like a frat party on steroids. Gluttony, drunkenness, and sexual immorality, and that's the culture of Thyatira. If you're in the guild, if you worked in this town, you're expected to go to the parties and participate. If you didn't show up, you weren't going to be part of the good old boys club. Go to the parties or run the risk of being ostracized by your community. But you know, that's part of being a follower of Jesus. You have to be prepared to be rejected. Jesus is very clear on this in John chapter 15. If the world hates you, keep in mind, hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as your own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you. A servant is not greater than his master if they persecuted me. They'll persecute you also. So the, the follower of Jesus Christ has got to be willing to separate and stand up, say what's right, what's wrong, and deal with the rejection that comes. And that's okay, because Jesus says, you'll be blessed, you'll be rewarded if you suffer for righteousness sake. And this is the Beatitudes, Matthew chapter five, Jesus said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when you're reviled and you're persecuted and they say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice, be exceedingly glad because great is your reward in heaven if they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So you just remain steadfast in your faith. You deal with the rejection. But there's this woman who calls herself a prophetess who's teaching in the church of Thyatira and she's telling the church She's telling the men, God says, just go to the guild banquet. Just eat and drink and have sex. It's fine. It's whatever. And Jesus gives her a special name. What does he call her? I have a few things against you because you allow, verse 20, that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things offered idols. Jezebel is a name, whew, that's synonymous with evil. The epitome of the wicked woman. It's, it's such an infamous name to this day. Nobody calls their baby daughters Jezebel, right? If there's two names we don't use, we don't call our boys Judas, right? And we don't got a lot of babies Jezebels being signed in. 
in the nursery. All the readers of the Old Testament know why, right? Because you, you know the story of evil Queen Jezebel. But let's review so we can understand why Jesus is giving this female prophetess teacher this particular name. So King Ahab, one of the worst kings of all of Israel, he married outside of the nation, which he wasn't supposed to do. He married a daughter of King Tyre, whose name was Jezebel, and she was a worshiper of Baal. She hated the God of Israel. She hated the prophets of Israel. She had as many of them as she could, rounded up, captured, and put to death. And King Ahab basically just let her run the whole show. So one of the stories that really displays for us the character of Jezebel and Ahab is found in 1 Kings 21. You can read it later, but let me uh, paraphrase the story for you. So there's this buddy, his name's Naboth, and he has a vineyard. And it's real close to the palace. And Ahab's like, man, that's a really nice vineyard. I'd like that vineyard. That'd be real handy for me to have that vineyard. And he offers to buy it from Naboth. But Naboth's like, I can't sell you the vineyard because that is my heritage. That's my inheritance. That was his family's land that was granted to them when they came in to the promised land. And by the laws of Moses, they weren't supposed to sell their inheritance. They're supposed to keep it in the family and pass it down. And plus, he really likes it. He doesn't want to sell it. So he tells the king that. And what does the king do? He pouts and he turns into a big whiny baby because he can't get his way. He stomps into the house and Jezebel says, don't worry, baby boy. I'll take care of this for you. And she cooks up a whole plot to have Naboth falsely accused of cursing God and cursing the king. And she pays some witnesses and they get up and they make this false accusation. And because of it, Naboth is stoned to death and he's killed. And then Jezebel claims his vineyard, claims his land and gives it to Ahab. So this shows us who Jezebel is and it illustrates for us what the Jezebel spirit is all about. Now, perhaps you noticed a red flag in Revelation chapter 2 text. We have this woman who calls herself a prophetess, and what is she doing? She's, let me read it for you again. Calls herself a prophetess who what? She's teaching. She teaches and seduces. So, if this lady was a real prophetess, she would not be contradicting the word of God. And that's the first part of recognizing the Jezebel spirit. Like all false spirits, it contradicts the word of God. The first thing being done here that contradicts God's word is the very act of the woman teaching and exercising spiritual authority over the men of the church. That right there was your first red flag because Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, let a woman learn quietly in submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. She must remain quiet. Women are not to be teaching and taking leadership authorities over the men. Yet Jezebel's teaching, and then what she's teaching also contradicts the word of God. Go to the party, eat the meat, sacrifice the idols, commit all the fornication, have all that great sex. Now, because of Revelation 20, people think that the Jezebel spirit is all about sexual immorality, and that's not accurate. It can and does use sexual immorality because it's such a powerful temptation. Yielding to the lust of the flesh is an easy way to get people to disobey God. But sex is not specifically what the spirit of Jezebel is all about. We need to understand the spirit because it is seducive, it is elusive, it is prevalent in our society and in the church. And it's so destructive when you succumb to it. So what the Jezebel spirit is, is what we saw in 1 Kings 21. It's what we see here in Revelation chapter 2. It's the teaching that tells us, it's the doctrine that tells us that we can have what we want. We can do what we want. What makes us feel good is what is good. And what makes us feel bad is bad. It lures us with lies away from the truth, away from the word of God, and has us believe that our sinful desires, our disobedience, is okay. So for the guys in the guild, Revelation chapter 2, Jezebel teaching is, go have a party. It's okay. Take what you want. 
You don't have to come out of the sin. You don't have to deny yourself and suffer for Jesus. Just be happy. Do what makes you feel happy. Like Queen Jezebel, don't worry, baby Ahab. You can have your vineyard. Mama gonna get baby what he want. The Jezebel spirit promotes toxic masculinity. Drink, gorge, and be a perv. It creates man-childs. Stay home and play video games all day long. It creates spoiled brats, for it refuses to discipline, and it protects people from the consequences. And how do I, does it do all that? It gets offended when you try to correct it. It gets insulted when you point out its fallacies. It gets violence. The Jezebel spirit is all about denying facts, but when you challenge it, it uses emotional manipulation. It screams and hollers and cries and storms out of the room when it doesn't get its way, when it doesn't hear affirming, validating messages. The Jezebel spirit says, get offended. Use emotional manipulation to make people stop speaking the word of God. How do I know this is what it is? Well, because of Naboth, he responded to Ahab with the law, and instead of accepting the truth, Jezebel lies and manipulates and gets the man to kill so the baby Ahab can have his way. Also, in 1 Kings chapter 18 to 19, let me tell you another story about Jezebel. God sends the prophet Elijah to tell Ahab and Jezebel because of their sins, because they worship this fertility god Baal, who supposedly controls the rain. God says, guess what? We'll see who controls the rain. No rain. Rain's done. Three-year drought. And he says, it's going to be a three-year drought. And that's what happens. And uh, does that make them repent? Does that make them go, ooh, our fertility god Baal's not really doing his job. Maybe we should listen to uh, Yahweh. But after three years, they're still stubborn. So Elijah lays down a challenge. And he lays down a challenge to the prophets, to the people, the nation, and King Ahab. And he takes them all up on a mountain, and he builds two altars. And he says, here's the deal. Uh, here's an altar to Baal, and here's an altar to Yahweh, the God of Israel. And whichever God lights their saw on fire is a true God. And whichever one can't show up and light their own little fire, it's not a true God. And the Baal guys say, we'll take that offer. So they start praying to Baal, and they're praying all day long. And they're praying, and they're chanting, and they're singing their songs, and Elijah starts making fun of them. He's like, well, maybe he's asleep, guys. Uh, yell louder. Uh, maybe he's in the bathroom. You know, you got to wake him up. So they're screaming, and they're dancing, and they're cutting themselves with knives, and they're bleeding. And what happens to Jezebel's false god? It does Nothing. And so then it's Elijah's turn. And he looks at his sacrifice, the bowl and the wood and the stones, and he says, you know what this really needs? This needs water, right? Let's dump water on this thing. And they dump buckets and buckets, and they drowned that sacrifice. The wood is soaked. They build a moat around it, and it all fills up with water. Have you ever tried to light wet wood on fire? It don't light. You, you couldn't light this thing with a torch. So it's all drowning and dripping. And then Elijah stands back and he prays to God. And God, what happens? He sends the fire from heaven and it burns the sacrifice and it burns the wet wood and it burns the stones and it licks up all the water in the moats. And everyone in Israel sees the truth. Baal's fake and Yahweh is the one true God. But wait, there's more. Then Elijah tells Ahab, it's time for the rain. Get ready. God, Yahweh, is bringing the rain. Three years of drought, and Elijah prays, and then God sends, it says, a heavy shower. It rains, it rains, and let it rain. Let it rain like that song, don't we? Ricky's going to do that one someday. Open the floodgates of heaven. And what does Jezebel do with those facts? 
She hears about the sacrifices. She hears about the drowning it in, wo- in water. She hears about the uh, fire coming down and burning the stones. She hears about the fact that Elijah said it's going to rain. She looks outside the window. She sees the rain. And she goes, wow, facts. I should listen to Yahweh. I should listen to the prophet Elijah. Is that what she says? No. She gets mad and she tries to have him killed. 1 Kings chapter 19, Ahab told Jezebel everything that Elijah had done and had killed the prophets with the sword. And Jezebel sent a message to Elijah, so may the gods do to me and more so, if not by this time tomorrow, I do not make your life like one of theirs. (sighs) Jezebel hates God's word, hates the truth, will not admit when she's wrong, when the facts are staring her in the face. All it will focus on is what it wants to be right. That's the Jezebel spirit. What it feels like is truth. Not what is actually true. And it gets mad, it gets violent when it can't get its way. No humility. And that's everywhere in our culture. Can I get an amen on that? uh, Let me illustrate a little bit. When a woman gets an abortion, they kill the baby in the womb, And then the doctor goes in there and tears all the little baby pieces out and puts it on a table here. There's little baby arms, baby legs, baby head. And when you try to explain those facts to people, that medical procedure, you show a picture and that Jezebel spirit gets enraged and it starts screaming about reproductive rights, hating women, the patriarchy. The Jezebel spirit calls you names and gets offended when you speak facts. We see it all over the place, don't we? Biological males, they shouldn't be competing in women's sports. That's not fair. That's transphobic, you hater. No, stating a fact in my opinion. But that's the Jezebel spirit. Give me what I want, agree with me, or else I get highly offended and I cancel you. I destroy you. And it's so easy to point it out in the culture war. And just look at the campuses for the last two weeks, right? Where do they get all those matching tents anyways? Hmm. It's a lying spirit. It's in our culture, and that's to be expected. Right? It's the world. But this message is to the... What? The church. The Jezebel spirit is in the the church. I could offend so many of you by simply reading Bible verses, Bible verses that disagree with your views. I know what they are. I know what buttons to push to draw that easily offended Jezebel spirit right out into the open. I've done it a time or two here, made people very uncomfortable. People have gotten up and left mid-sermon. I did it in Canada and they tried to fire me. I know how to expose it. If you're ever brave enough to tell the inconvenient truth, you will see it. That's why the average length of a pastor in a church is four years. Your six months is uh, your honeymoon period. And then by that amount of time, you start noticing, here's some things we need to work on. Here's some things we should challenge. And you start working on it. And whoo, that's when people get offended. And then they start campaigning to get rid of you. Now, if the church is offended because you're not following the word of God, if you're teaching error, well, that's not the Jezebel spirit. But when you teach truth and they get offended, that's it. I know how to arouse that Jezebel spirit. It's here. It's always around. Well, if you know that, Pastor Rob, why don't you take it on? Oh, I do. I'm just, I'm, I'm more surgical now. Back in the day when I was a young, inexperienced preacher, you know, I just went brass knuckles. Let's go! <laughs> just going to tell you what's truth when I go right at you. Hammer you with the facts. You're going to get offended. I don't care because I'm right. Chapter verse. The spirit of Jezebel doesn't care about facts. It moves around and it checks on everybody's feelings. Feeling okay, somebody? Feeling okay? And if chapter verse doesn't matter then. If it felt bad, it can't be good. You know what good preaching is supposed to do, eh? It's supposed to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. 
And everybody wants to be comforted and nobody wants to be afflicted. Nobody wants to hear their sin called out. Makes them feel bad. And I've learned when people are offended, they're never going to listen to the facts. They're never going to listen to the verses. So I've learned and I'm still learning and then my wife helps with this to be more surgical. What's the surgical approach, you ask? It's two steps. Write this one down. Nobody cares what you know until they know that you care, right? Verse number 19, I know your works. What are they? Love, service, faith, and patience. Patience. See, that's the one I'm working on. Yes, people are believing lies. They're doing what's wrong. Yes, you need to speak the truth, but you need to speak the truth in love, right? Speak the truth in love. Meekness, gentleness, serving, developing rapport, building trust, and being, what's that last one? Patient. Elijah declares the word of the Lord to Ahab and Jezebel, and then he goes into hiding for how long? Three years, lives in a cave, for three years, birds feed him food. That was no fun. He had to be patient. He had to wait on the Lord. We have to be steadfast, not compliant, not tolerant, but faithful to the method of loving and serving people. Verse 21. I gave her, Jesus says, time to repent of her sexual immorality. I gave her time to repent. Aren't you thankful that God was patient with you and you didn't know Jesus when you were in your sin doing all your mess? Aren't you glad Jesus was patient with you? So that's step one. Step two to surgical is you got to wait for Jesus to bring the pain. Not me, not you with the brass knuckles. Jesus, listen to what he said. I gave her time to repent. She did not repent. Verse 22, I will cast her into the sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with the death and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts and will give each one of you according to your works. Jesus uses sickness to get people's attention. People in sin, children of God, Church people in sin are, who are stubborn in it, oh, they're going to suffer. It's coming. You're going to get some pain. C.S. Lewis said, pain is God's megaphone. What do you do with a get megaphone? You yell at people. Get your attention. And we know this to be true because Paul said, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. This is one of our favorite passages before we do communion. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul says, This I received of the Lord, that which I deliver unto you, the Lord Jesus, the night he was betrayed, took the bread, when he had given thanks, broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Look down, verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup in an unworthy manner is guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Let a man examine himself so that he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. He who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick and many sleep, meaning they die. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. So again, these warnings are to the church, the person claiming to be a believer. We see people who are dealing with physical pain, emotional pain, relational pain, financial pain. They're not feeling the blessings of God. And then after enough pain, they finally come in in a bout of desperation and they come in and talk to us. And in that moment, we can all of a sudden ask some hard questions. You know, are you doing something that makes you feel good, but is disobedient to God's word? Your children's are, your little hellions going crazy. Okay, are, are we applying biblical methods to our parenting, or are we going with what feels right? 
what the world says is good, but that contradicts the word of God. We've got to ask hard questions. When the people are hurting enough and desperate enough, that's when they stop listening to the spirit of Jezebel and they start listening to the truth. Again, verse number 23, I will kill their children with death and all the church will know I am he who searches the heart and the minds and I give each one of you according to your works. That is scary stuff. You keep rejecting God's word and listening to that spirit and you're going to hurt yourself. You're going to hurt your family. It can destroy everything that you claim you love. The world is going to get offended and they're going to try to cancel us because of the truths of God's word. Oh, well, can't be worried about that. It's when the church has that spirit. That's when, that's when we have a serious problem. Verse 24, now to you I say and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine who do not know the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what I have till I come. He who overcomes and keeps my works until the end to him, I will give power over the nations, rule them with a rod of iron. Here's this prophecy about Jesus, dashing to pieces like a potter's vessel. I also receive from my father and I give him the morning star. Just like Elijah, verse 25 we have to overcome, hold fast. And the one who endures, what did we do? We inherit the nations. He gives us the morning star. What's the morning star? The morning star is the harbinger of the day. As the night falls away and a new day dawns, the morning star, the most prominent and beautiful of the celestial bodies, and as the darkness and evilest world gives way to the brightness of the God's glorious kingdom, Jesus himself will capture our attention and usher in a brand new day. Jesus is the morning star, Revelation 22, verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you of these things for the churches. I am the root and descendant of David, the bright and morning star. When we overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil, we inherit all that Jesus has, and we, like him, become the children of God. In order to get that, we have to be faithful, steadfast, overcomers. When you hear God's word, are you humbled? Or are you offended? Do you use a bunch of emotional manipulation to try to get your way? Or will you patiently, faithfully submit to truth? We know which spirit controls you by your responses and your reactions. That's how we know. Lord, we pray for the humility. We pray for the truth to cut through to the very core of who we are and move us out of darkness to light. Jesus, we know one day you're coming back and you're going to judge every man's deeds, every man's works. And may our works be love, service, faithfulness, and patience. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.